Okay, I guess we're going. Hey, everybody, welcome back to another Deep Astronomy live stream. This is the place where we can and we often do divide by zero, and we pay the consequences for it. <laughs> My name is Tony Darnell. I run this dumpster fire of a house every Tuesday and Thursday, and today I want to talk about exploring the moons of Jupiter. There's two missions coming up, one of which I haven't talked about at all. That's ESA's use mission. And the other one is Europa Clipper. I wanted to talk about this because one of them, you have to guess which, is launching this year. So pretty cool. I now thought we'd talk about going to Jupiter and, and uh, seeing what's possible that way. So, but Anybody who knows anything about space telescopes and exploring the solar system in the universe knows that yesterday we reached an important milestone with the James Webb Space Telescope. And I want to, we are fully deployed, this telescope is. And so I, let's take a look at where we are. This was exciting news yesterday. We have, yesterday was a L2 insertion burn, which means that it is there. The James Webb Space Telescope is where it needs to be uh, in the L2 orbit. And it was uh, burned, let's see, they burned the, uh, the rockets on there about five minutes or so to get it into the orbital burn. And this is where it is, L2. There's Earth, went right straight past the moon and out to this L2 orbit right here. This will be its home forever. It's got a, uh, this orbit here is where it will uh, sit. And you can see the orientation here in this graphic that the heat shield, sun shield business is all pointed this way towards Earth and uh, the sun and keeps these things cooled. So um, so this is pretty cool. Uh, Jeff Faust was talking about this in his, in his uh, post on it yesterday. Uh, I follow his stuff pretty closely. I recommend you do too. Um, but let's see here. The At 2 p.m. yesterday, uh, they, a spacecraft, uh, the spacecraft fired a thruster for about five minutes, changing the spacecraft's velocity by approximately one and a half meters per second the small maneuver was sufficient to place JWST in a halo orbit around the Earth-Sun L2 Lagrange point, a million and a half kilometers away. So Webb is now officially on station at its L2 orbit. That's from Keith Parrish, the JWST Observatory Commissioning Manager. And this is capping off, he says, a remarkable 30 days. Well, I'll say, I, I, am, I am happy, I am happily surprised that this uh that this launch and deployment has gone as well as it has so it's been um it's been a really amazing thing to watch i've i've uh re big sigh of relief and i know you guys are too because of this it's been one of those things where many people didn't think it was gonna it was gonna uh it was gonna go um so because the launch went so well because the Ariane 5 rocket operated by Ariane Space went so flawlessly and put Webb exactly where it needed to be, they were they are now able, they saved enough fuel from that launch that they don't have to do any corrections, that they've now extended the mission to probably close to 20 years. Nominally, it was supposed to go to 10. So we could thank ESA and Ariane Space for this additional time for the mission because they did such a great job. Um, so now, where are we? So again, looking at this article from Jeff Faust, uh, Amy Lowe, the vehicle engineering lead for JWST, says uh, other aspects of JWST are working well. This includes tests of the, of the spacecraft KA-band high-gain antenna, so that works. In terms of all the nuts and bolts on the observatory, everything has been switched on and checked out. Now, while JWST is in its final orbit, NASA still has months of work to commission the telescope and its instruments. For example, the 18 segments of the primary mirror have all moved off of their launch mounts. That's important. Um, and the JWST optical telescope Element manager uh, said that all engineers will soon will soon start the process of aligning these mirrors. 
So what they're going to do is look at a single bright star. In fact, here's the star they're going to look at. I have that up right here. Um, this is Stellarium. Let me make this embiggened. So what JWST is going to look at in the process of commissioning and focusing this telescope is a star known as HD 84406. It's located right here in the constellation of Ursa Major, just off the Big Dipper asterism. Here is the sky, according to Stellarium, uh, tonight at my place at about 10 o'clock my time, Eastern time. The Big Dipper will be sitting on its on its uh, handle like this at about that time. And this star right here, HD 44. 84406 is what JWST is going to use to focus. When that star gets in focus, there's not 18 different stars. It's all converged into one and it's in focus. And they can make that a pinpoint of light much better than this example. Then JWST is in focus. That's going to take months and months of work to do. So that's where it's going to look. And I was also reading this article here by Eric Berger, whom I also follow quite a bit. And this was a really good article because, you know, he was like, he felt the way I kind of do about this whole thing. It's like, to my surprise and elation, the web space telescope is really going to work. And he described in this article, a, a conversation that he had with, uh, uh, John Grunsfeld, who at the time had just retired when they talked about five years ago. And uh, he said that he thought something would probably go sideways. And then where would NASA be the next time it went to Congress and asked for big money to fund an ambitious science project? He felt much like we all did at this point. Please, God, let this work, because if it doesn't, we are NASA is royally screwed. Um, but not only did it launch, uh, the Ariane 5 rocket performed so great that now we have extra fuel and... Um, this means that when that the Webb Space Telescope has reached its final destination and that orbit, that L2 orbit is a 180 degree circle that it makes. I'm sorry, a 180 day circuit that it makes. It goes around this. Let me put this one up. It goes around this circle once every 180 days. Uh, and um, so it's all there. It's all worked. And so I want to just leave this with uh, something that, um, Eric wrote in his article, he says, I have only, I have only been a, a very outside observer of this process over the last five years, knowing enough to be concerned about the fate of this $10 billion telescope, but not facing any serious consequences should it fail. Even so I have worried, I have worried continuously about the fate of Webb. At times I have despaired about it over ever making a science observation. So I have felt elated over the last couple of weeks as everything has fallen neatly into place. I can only imagine the utter delight of astronomers, physicists, and scientists who have worked directly on this project. Bravo to you all. So I just want to, I will leave that with uh, those words of Eric Berger right here uh, from this article. And I could not agree more. This has been one hell of a ride. And NASA deserves nothing but kudos and credit so does isa and arianne space wow what a good job you guys did to get that thing up there so now it's just a matter of focusing on this star right here and that's where it's going to be looking for the next several months as it gets these actuators and these these different mirror segments slowly um uh, moved into place so that it it focuses. By the way, they I've read, I've heard scientists and astronomers say that the rate at which they move these mirror segments is about the same as that with which grass grows. So that <laughs> that's a strange uh, way to think of it. But you know, it's a uh, it's a slow process uh, to get it out there. So to get it focused, HD eight four four zero six. It is a star. That is, it says here, 258 
light years away. It's a G5 star. It's got it's a magnitude of 6.94. And um, so I would encourage you to look at it with your uh, space, with your own telescopes if you can. It's over here. But while you're at it, go check out M M81, which is right here. <laughs> so there's M81 very close by. And a really cool object in uh, in the night sky as well. Bode's galaxy, it says. By the way, this is Stellarium on the web. I'm not running this app. I'm running it in a browser. So if you go to stellarium-web.org, you can do this too. It's really cool. I've not played with this since... Uh, well, I usually use Stellarium on the desktop. I didn't know they had this until I was playing around and I wanted to see what the latest version was. And I found this. And now I don't have to do... Um, anything. I can just use this. So, okay. Where's my cursor? There it is. <clears throat> so I'm streaming on Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, YouTube. So interact. I've got the chat here. Let's see who's here. Dennis, Dennis is here. It's good to see you again. Good evening. Um, Faisal is here. Uh, welcome. It's good to see Galaxia. It's good to see you back. Uh, let's see. Official Mistari is here. He's He was asking um, if we were going to have a stream today. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that music. Do you know, do you remember a couple streams back last week, Galaxia, when I just, so I, I Many of you know that I stream using this thing called Restream, right? It's a web-based system, which I love. It costs a lot of money, but I love this experience. If for no other reason, then I can do what I just did here, which is show these chats. It gathers all the chats from all the different platforms I'm streaming on, and I can do this kind of thing. Well, do you remember, a couple? it has a feature on it that lets me put ambient music in the background. And so what I did was I started a stream about five minutes early so that everybody can get their notifications and settle down with a cup of beverage or whatever and sit down. And I played this ambient music that I have access to. As far as I know, it's, you know, they wouldn't put anything on there that isn't copyrighted or copyright free, or at least I had permission to use. Well, guess what? I got a content ID strike for that stream. Not only that, remember back in December when I did the JWST therapy stream and I played NASA's, the NASA produced trailer that was really good and really awesome. And I played it on the live stream. That also got me another strike on the content ID system. It happens right away. As soon as I end the stream, by the way, uh, there has been a copyright violation on your latest stream. Don't worry. We, you're nothing, you don't need to do anything, but we're going to show ads because you did that. So again, let me, I want to emphasize that I have demonetized this channel on YouTube. If you are seeing ads on YouTube, that is YouTube ripping me off. Just want to say that's all the videos that I don't have control over that ads get shown on. Sorry, Galaxia, but that, you know, I'm probably going to get a hit for playing that 30 second video because it had music in it. So anyhow, um, Austin 360 uh, or N360. Good to see you. Thanks for joining from the UK. I appreciate it. <laughs> That's right. Where we can and often do divide by zero. It is, it is strictly forbidden, but we do it anyway. Don't tell us what to do. <laughs> don't, don't tread on me, bro. All right. Uh, uh oh, video freezing. Okay, I hope it's not freezing. It's not freezing with me. Um, that's why I kind of do this random stuff at the beginning of the stream to get all this stuff worked out. Uh, so hopefully it's um, it's not doing that anymore. Ebone wants to know: Is it true that they expect that the scope will have a life of twenty years instead of ten? Yes, that's what they're saying. That because now it was nominally going to be ten because they had to factor in all this. Uh, reserve for the fuels, right? When they launched JWST up into space, they expected to have to do a lot of, well, they didn't know everything they had to, that was going to happen, but they did have to plan for the fact that it maybe wasn't put in the exact right spot. And the JWST was going to do, although spacecraft was going to have to do all these corrections to get it to L2. 
Well, it was done so well that they uh, don't have to do any corrections and they saved about 10 years worth of fuel because that's the limiting factor on this thing, according to mission planners, was when the was when the correcting or when the fuel runs out uh, is when the mission's over. Um, so <clears throat> where is JWST right now? I would like to look in the right direction and I think imagine about, that's a really good question. So hmm, where is Webb? So the, the L2 points, let's see. Where is Webb? So it says it's at L2. I remember I showed that animation of the L2 point. Um, and it's, I don't know. I don't know how you can find out where it is exactly, but it follows the earth as it goes around the sun. And I know what you're asking. You want to know where in the sky is it right now? Where's the L2 point right now? And that's a really good question. Um, I'm just going to take a quick moment and see if I can find that. Um, let's see. Oh, it doesn't, I don't know if I can see where it is right this, I think it's a line. So here's what I'm going to say. I don't know if this is exactly true, but as I visualize these L2 points and I don't have the graphic handy, I have to go search for it, but I had a graphic of all the L2 points. I'm sorry, of all the Lagrange points. And um, let me just see earth, sun, L, Lagrange points. <sighs> and all right let me just so here here let me just put I, here's the here's a quick graphic so uh, it, it's a line between the earth and the sun so l3 would be directly opposite of where the sun is so if you ever wanted to know where l3 is you just got to know where the sun is and it's past that so it would be a line from the earth to the sun would where what was where you would see L2. And you'd have to wait until night to see it. So you would be a roughly 12 hours, um, 12 hours or when the sun is directly opposite the, your part of the globe, wherever it is, look straight up at Zenith. And that should be where it is. That's how, that's how you can do a quick, um, a quick estimate of it. So I guess, I guess if you, I guess if you, um, note sunrise, uh, or sunset, and then, you know, figure out where the earth is at that moment, let's say, I don't know, what is it? Six hours after sunset, maybe this time of year, um, in the Northern hemisphere There's a lot of geometry you got to figure out, but then you just look Zenith at about that point where the sun is directly opposite you. And then that's, the general area of L2. And I don't know in what constellation it would be. Um, it would be close. Let's see. I'm sorry. I'm thinking about this now. The it So it would be the ecliptic. It would be on the ecliptic, the ecliptic plane. So let's, let's pull up Stellarium. Let me back up a little bit. Um, and let me see. Can I show... Where's the eclipse equatorial grid night mode azimuthal grid? What is this? All right, well, this is azimuthal equatorial. That's what we want. Let's get rid of that. All right, so here is the equal. So there is the North Pole. So you would be looking somewhere along the ecliptic, which will be this red line here, and then you would go at the zenith. So if I go right now, I've got this set at, um, so right now I've got this set at behind this about 10 o'clock my time. Let me go to midnight my time. Well, that's close enough. That's about midnight my time. The sun is more or less on the other side of the earth. If I follow the ecliptic, which is the path the sun follows across the sky. Um, 
and the zenith where I were close to the zenith. So look south. I'm going to say it's around Gemini right now. You see how I did that? Here's the ecliptic right here. I'm assuming at about, I don't know, midnight my time, the sun is directly opposite me. It may not be, uh, but even if I'm off by an hour or two, uh, it's going to be somewhere in here. So I'm going to say the L2 point, as you look up in the sky, is going to be close to Gemini. Test me on this. Somebody with math, no, see if I'm right. I predict that the Jada, if you look towards Gemini, you will see the area where the James Webb Space Telescope is. My reasoning is that the L2 point is a gravitational point between the Earth and the Sun. L3 is directly opposite. We're at that line uh, on the uh, line of sight. L2 is the exact opposite other way, a million and a half kilometers the other way. And because we are on the plane, the we need to be on the plane of the Earth-Sun system. That's where the ecliptic is. Uh, that's the path the sun follows across our sky, the apparent path that doesn't really travel across the sky as we know. Then I think that's where it would be, is in Gemini right there. Hope I didn't just embarrass myself. That's a good question though, Galaxia. I like that. That was really good. Okay. Hopefully I didn't just screw this up. All right. Let me see what you guys said about it. Did I, did I screw anything up guys? Um, Uncle Bill says, well, how'd you figure that out? Uncle Bill. Oh, I see down here. So, um, so it's not on the ecliptic. So there's Monoceros there, just a little bit further down. I was close. Why wouldn't it be on the ecliptic though? That's what I want to know. So that's a constellation that's ill-defined, but it's just to the left of Orion. Um, I can never, I never find this exactly. Procyon's a very bright star, so you can see you're in that constellation if you can see it. And it's right above Sirius, which you can't miss. So, uh, of course, Orion's pretty easy to see. So, I don't know. I guess it's not on the ecliptic. Maybe that's because, oh, the tilt of the Earth. Right. So, the tilt of the Earth screwed that up. So, while that is... Maybe that's why it's down lower. I don't know. Anyway, thank you, Uncle Bill. Um, so, um, and he's also comment, commenting that uh, thesekylive.com has excellent finder data. Uh, let's just go. I'm going to the sky live. Um, proceed. Thank you. The sky live. Um, constellations. Okay, this looks a little busier than I wanted. I had hoped for something a little more easier to deal with. But this, wow, that's kind of cool. Okay, wow, thanks for that, Uncle Bill. Um, maybe the Skyview app had a JWSD. Maybe, I don't, I don't think it does spacecraft. Maybe it does. Um, It's orbiting L2. Ah, okay. It's orbiting L2, so it won't be on the ecliptic. Yeah, but we're only talking a few hundred, well, what is it? A few hundred kilometers? Is that the the diameter of that um the diameter of that orbit? It's not huge. So so I guess. Oh, look at so now Peter's gonna give me grief. Schoolboy mistake, Tony. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Appreciate it. <laughs> All right. So let's see. Stellarium has a location finder for JWST. Oh, well, that would have been easier, I suppose. All right, let's go. Let's see. All right. Artificial satellite. And was I wrong? Uh, where is it? Oh, 
Okay, so it must be, it must be. Must be below by horizon, so I can't, I don't think I can see it. Huh, okay. Well, I can't find it where I'm at, so I must not be able to see it. Wow, Stellarium is really cool. Okay, well, there you go. <coughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, John. Oh, Jimmy D. It's good to see you, man. Um, hey, John. It's good to see you. Yeah, you didn't miss. <laughs> I just, I'm just rambling here. It is a half hour into the stream, and I haven't even started what I'm going to talk about. Yeah, so you didn't miss nothing, man. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Webb's rotation in about L2 is a very large circle in our sky. Okay, so um, it must be bigger than I think. Anyway, um, play with that at your a lot. You guys, you guys are more um, more versed in what these things can do than I am. I guess I haven't played in Stellarium in a long time, but my reasoning wasn't so bad, right? I mean, I got close. <laughs> at least I think I'm close. Um, anyway. Uh, I always try to figure things out from first principles anyhow. So, all right. Anyway, what's great about you guys is that we can ask questions and we can figure it out ourselves. Um, oh, and apparently Jimmy D is saying that um, Unistellar gives you a way to observe um, to observe these things too. So uh, I'm not going to go to that website because I'm taking too much time on this. <clears throat> okay. So one of the reasons <clears throat> that I do these streams is I like to keep myself up on top of on top of topics that interest me. And one of the things I'm very interested in is these upcoming missions to Jupiter. And I have not in any content that I've created so far talked about ESA's juice mission. And so I thought that I would do that real quick. Um, notes that I took before I got here. And um, let me also put up this, <laughs> this website. I got to say, I'm going to show you a difference here in a minute between these two websites. But um, this is the ESA's Juice website right here. And the um, the Juice spacecraft, it stands for, uh, it stands for Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer. And uh, it uses the J-U from Jupiter, the I-C from Icy, and then E for Explorer. So Jupiter Icy Moon Explorer. And it's going to address two themes that of the ESA's Cosmic Vision Program. What are the what are the conditions for planet formation and emergence of life? That's a good science goal. And how does the solar system work? Now, that seems a very ill-defined science mission or science goal, but that is something that is planning on looking into. And um, so it's going to go to Jupiter and its system, and it's and it's going to look at all the interrelations, all the complexity and stuff like that of the with uh, of the Jovian system as a whole, with a particular emphasis on Ganymede, um, which I which we haven't really observed or had many flybys other than what Juno has managed to do recently. Uh, so this will be a mission geared primarily, or at least will have a heavy emphasis on Ganymede. And uh, and also it will go towards uh, Callista and Europa, uh, so it's going to and it'll take pictures of all these different moons. But it's primarily designed to go out and look at these moons of Jupiter. And 
Um, so what, what the website says is that the focus of juice is to characterize the conditions that may have led to the emergence of habitable environments among the Jovian icy satellites with special emphasis on three ocean bearing worlds, Ganymede, Europa, and Callisto. Now Ganymede is identified, uh, for detailed investigation since it provides a natural laboratory for analysis of the nature, evolution, and potential habitability of icy worlds in general, but also because of the role it plays with the system of Galilean satellites. It's the largest of the moons and its unique uh, magnetic and plasma interactions with the surrounding Jovian environment. So uh, they want to look at Ganymede in particular, and to a lesser extent, Callisto, uh, but they want to characterize the ocean layers and the detection of putative subsurface water reservoirs. That's one of the things they want to look at there. Uh, they want to look at topographical, geological, and they want to do compositional mapping of the surface. Uh, they want to study the physical properties of the ice crust. And they're going to have radar and spectrometers and all this kind of stuff on board that they're going to be using to do this with. Uh, they want to investigate the exosphere uh, of the moons themselves. I'm not quite sure what an exosphere is. I think it must be the outer crust of these moons and the study of Ganymede's intrinsic magnetic field and its interactions with the Jovian magnetosphere. This is important stuff. I, you, you guys have heard me talk about the importance of magnetic fields for life to begin with and, and Ganymede, uh, they want to characterize any magnetic field that it has. So, and then, and on Europa, what they're going to do is it will focus on chemistry, which is essential to life. Again, remember I told you I had those spectrographs on board. Uh, it'll, and it's going to look at organic molecules, understanding the formation of surface features and composition of, of the non-water ice material. And JUICE will also provide the first subsurface sounding of the moon uh, for Europa, uh, including the first, first determination of microbial thickness uh, of minimal thickness of the icy crust over the mostly recent of the most recently active regions. As you know, Europa is thought to have water underneath its icy crust, and this will be the first time we've looked directly at the subsurface portions of Europa using instruments designed to do that. So ESA will be the first to get there. It's going to be close though. Uh, uh, Juice is going to launch this year. In fact, there is a link. I put it in the description box on YouTube of this website here. Um, on February 9th, I found this when I was getting ready for the stream. On February 9th, the, uh, th this university or East Hampton, New York is going to have a free lecture, uh, uh, at one o'clock Eastern time. It's Wednesday, February 9th. I highly recommend you listen to it if you want to learn more about juice. Um, so this will be um, uh, a talk by Nicholas uh, Altabelli. He works at the EA. He works at ESA uh, in Madrid, Spain. And um, I guess he's working on this mission. So if you're interested more in juice, this is a hangout you should probably go to. It's free. And uh, uh, it will teach you more about it um, as they go. So I'm going to I'm going to try and go. It depends. Wednesday is a tough day for me, but I'm going to try and check this out as well. So the link to this description on the YouTube event and you guys can check it out. Uh, so it's going to launch in 2022 um, on an Ariane 5 rocket. The exact time it's going to launch the date. I don't think they have a launch date for it yet. Um, and it's going to use Venus and Earth in gravity assist to get to Jupiter. And it'll take seven and a half years to get to Jupiter. Um, and it's expected to get there. The orbital insertion, the first orbital insertion for Jupiter is expected in January of 2030. And it will look at the Jovian system for about two and a half to three and a half years. So by 2033, this mission will be over. And, uh, so that is the ESA JUICE mission, the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer mission. Now, <laughs> so <laughs> here, here is the ESA webpage, and I love ESA. I do. I mean, this is this is, you know, this is very. Uh, they're, they're a great organization and everything else, but. Uh, they got to work on their webpage. Look at the difference between ESA and 
NASA and JPL's Europa Clipper mission. <laughs> it's quite a bit of difference. For example, I'm, I'm on uh, europa.nasa.gov and I can scroll through here. This website is pretty crazy. Scientists are almost certain a vast ocean lies beneath Europa's icy shell. In 2024, the, the journey begins. Clipper is being crafted with one overarching goal. Determine if Europa harbors conditions suitable for life. Why Europa? Because Europa has the ingredients essential for life. Water, chemistry, and energy. All I'm doing is scrolling down. For water, liquid water is the essential uh, is essential for complex chemistry that makes life on Earth possible. Scientists predict a salty ocean lies beneath Europa's surface, which has more water than Earth's oceans combined. The chemistry of life relies on elements that are common in the universe. For Europa to be habitable, it needs the essential building blocks for life: carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and sulfur, to name just a few. And it needs energy. How does an icy moon far from the sun get the energy needed to sustain life? Jupiter's strong gravity creates tides on Europa that stretch and tug the moon, producing heat. If there is life on Europa, it almost certainly was completely independent from the origin of life on Earth. That would mean the origin of life must be pretty easy throughout the galaxy and beyond. This is something you, and Nick Bostrom also uh, made that. Uh, makes that argument as well when he talks about life in the universe. So that is the web page for, for Europa Clipper, which, wow, that's pretty good. I mean, I, you know, there's this, which, okay, yeah, here's the, here's the, uh, I mean, it's very web 1.0. And then there's this, you know, Europa Clipper, uh, very full of multimedia. So say what you will about NASA. They get this public relations thing down as far as, um, how to make uh, how to make their missions look cool anyway. Um, so anyway, when is it? So when's it going to launch? Well, it's nominally going to launch October tenth, twenty twenty four. That's a couple of years after uh, Juice gets on its way, and it'll arrive in April of twenty thirty. Remember, Juice gets there in January twenty thirty. This will get here in uh, April of twenty thirty. 2030 is going to be a big deal uh, for the Jovian system. So this that's when it arrives. Now they're going to they're going to Europa Clipper is going to primarily look at Europa, but it will be looking at other things uh, as well. Um, but the uh, the primary mission is to look and make sure that Europa is inhabitable. It's designed to look primarily at the the moon, but it will also look at Ganymede and Callisto, and it will. Once it's in orbit around Jupiter, it will make 40 to 50 close passes over Europa, shifting its flight path for each flyby, flyby to soar over a different location so that it eventually scans nearly the entire moon. Europa's clipper altitude will vary from 2,700 kilometers to 25 kilometers above the moon's surface at closest approach. Most of the flybys will be about 60 miles or 100 kilometers uh, high, and the spacecraft will also swing by two other large Jovian moons, Ganymede and Callisto, to help shape and redirect its orbit. So Isaac Newton is in the driver's seat for almost all of our uh, spacecraft that we launch in the solar system. JWST was one example, uh, but now we've got these other ones. Using gravity assists, how long it takes to get to Jupiter depends an, aw an awful lot on how you use the inner planets to do uh, gravity gravity assists. You can get there faster if you have more assists. Remember Voyager 1 and 2, the big driver for when, for when they were launched in the 70s was because there was this grand alignment of all the planets that allowed for a very fast trajectory to Jupiter uh, using all the planet, using a lot of the planets. And then it was able to use the gravity to get also to the outer planets, Saturn, uh, Uranus, and Neptune. So, um, so there's a lot to look forward to with respect to, um, exploring our solar system. <coughs> yes, that's right. Uncle Bill, it was called the grand tour. 
and there was a planetary alignment that I don't think we're going to get anytime soon again for this. So it, it was, uh, it was, uh, um, the beneficiary of that great alignment. RB is commenting. The difference is ESA is not directly dependent on public opinion or politics, only indirect. NASA is dependent on Congress for, oops, on Congress for money. Uh, Congress needs votes. Votes equals the people. Yeah, I agree. But I also, I mean, that's great that, that ESA is on a different footing than NASA is. And I agree with you that NASA is most definitely at the mercy of Congress and public opinion uh, for a lot of its money. But considering that we only spend, what is it, $60 billion a year on NASA, um, you know, it's the, the, the funding priorities, the changes that would result by not funding NASA will be so minuscule as to not matter at all. But you are right. My point, though, is that NASA recognizes the importance of gathering public in, um, inspiration and, 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 uh, making, you know, the image that it has and cultivating the image that it has that works for and against NASA in many ways, because NASA is so conservative in their public messaging. They often, you know, frustrate a lot of people when they don't talk about things that could potentially be bad. Um, I was amazed that Thomas Zerbukum said some of the things he said leading up to JWST, because he was like acknowledging, you know, we're, we're going to be screwed if this thing doesn't deploy. That's something NASA never says, but, um, but they have, you know, it is important. And I've come to learn this over, over the years myself. It is important to have an, have a good science communication connection with the general public, regardless of what you're doing. So I would encourage you to, even if they don't depend on it, they, to maybe put up some, you know, some better, some more effort on some of their forward facing, uh, communications. ESO does this. The European Southern Observatory does this. They have had an above average, way before NASA even had one, web presence that and and and, and a bunch of uh, uh, resources that the public can use to learn about what the ESO is doing. Um, in fact, that was among the very first resources I ever used when making uh, when making astronomy videos. So it can't be done. I mean, I they and I don't. <laughs> I'm making fun of them, but you know, it's just because wow, that was quite a difference between the two websites. Um, but, you know, there's no denying the quality and the work that ESA does. I mean, we've also got Mars. What are they calling it? Uh, ExoMars. Is that right? Um, that's happening this year, I think, also from ESA, where they're launching a, a rover of their own um, and putting it on Mars. So um, they do ex astounding, astounding work. And <laughs> the Ariane 5 launch of JWST is proof and, is proof and point that, the, um, uh, that they can do this stuff really well. Um, and ESA is, and, and yeah, that's, I guess my point, Galaxy, is it's old fashioned, right? It's just, it, 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 it looks at it. It's very web 1.0, a lot of their fault. When I, whenever I want to learn about a new mission, I'm always surprised at, at how hard I have to dig. Like, for example, in the, on the web page for this, it says that the launch is sometime in 2023. Um, yeah, the Juice spacecraft will be launched in 2023. It says it right here. Be launched in 2023 and the area by an Ariane 5 rocket. But I go over here to this thing where this lecture is, and it says it will launch in 2022 for a journey to Jupiter and its icy moons. So, what is it? I mean, I, I imagine it's 2022 this year now, but this web page has still not been updated um, to reflect the the change. And if you look at the timeline for the mission, it's all very general, right? Um, uh, so it says here that the mission duration is close to 11 years. About three and a half of years will be spent in the Jupiter system um, with launch opportunities in 2022 and 2023. Uh, the nominal mission would end in June 2033 uh, and 2034, respectively, depending on when it launched. So, you know, the, the last update was back in November. Um, I don't know. It just seems like we could do a little bit better on this. But, you know, I don't I'm not going to sit here and criticize them. They're doing really good, really good work. So. <clears throat> 
So, and the Galaxy is commenting. Um, they also don't. They also don't have really good videos nor public outreach. That's why I love NASA way, way more. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, hey, nobody's talking crap about ESA. I'm trying to. I'm trying to say that ESA. In fact, nobody talks about ESA. I think more than I do. I, I get all all of the uh, ESA missions. At least I do something on every single thing they they launch and do. So. Um, uh, I, I, I think I'm doing really fair by them. I think you do a great job. <clears throat> okay. Any questions, any comments? I read that that alignment happens every once every 170 years. Yeah. That's about what I remember too. I think the grand tour, uh, alignment. So Will is commenting. Um, I I do believe that simple single cell organisms are a lot more common than we think. Um, silicon and, or ammonia. Um, well, silicon or pneumonia aren't single cell organisms, but I think I see your point. Yeah, I do. I, I was of the opinion for a long time as I was growing up in the science communication world, I was arguing that I would love to know how hard it is to go from having a primordial soup, which has all the ingredients of life, but isn't life, to something that's alive. And as I've talked with astrobiologists and evolutionary biologists over the course of the years on hangouts and other things, I've learned that there is a, first of all, uh, a lot of gray area in terms of defining what life is. But if you follows certain basic characteristics, you know, reproduction and respiration and, and all of this stuff, then it's considered very simple life. There's even a spectrum of that, of how much that would, you know, cover. That's actually not so hard to make. I've come to think. We don't know for sure because we've not found life independently elsewhere. As they've said on these websites I just read to you, that if we find something on Europa, almost certainly it evolved independently of Earth. Uh, I think because it's surrounded and enclosed in that icy crust and it wouldn't get any sort of panspermia-related uh, contamination from Earth that way. Plus, getting out there would be very hard uh, once life did form here on Earth. So if that's true... And we find life on Europa, simple life, little amoebas floating around, whatever it is, right? We, I, we call it simple life, but biologists get mad even when we say that about bacteria, because apparently that's pretty complicated. And so if we do find any of that there, then it's, and it's independent of having formed on, you know, having nothing to do with earth, then life is probably very common in the universe. I mean, think about it. Life evolves on earth for whatever reason, even panspermia, panspermia related life, you know, so it comes, you know, a, a meteor hits earth filled with organisms that eventually turn into life on earth. Life evolves, becomes what it is today. That happens here. And then somewhere else in the solar system, it happens again, but this time it, it's not from Earth. The life isn't from Earth. It's from its own independent mechanism. If that happens in twice in the same solar system, then it has to be everywhere because it has to be easy to do. It happened twice just in one solar system independently. So life is probably very common, that form of life at least. Life starting is is pretty common. And if that's true, then it's probably everywhere in the universe, comparatively speaking. Anything that can harbor these uh, these smaller forms of life, it probably does. If it can evolve, it probably will. But that doesn't mean, that doesn't follow, that we will get more advanced forms of life, especially in the form of an intelligence. Um, that, that may not be very common. Um, again, we've got a long way to go to answer any of these questions. But if we can find that life is common, period, even plants, things like that, that's a big, that's a big stepping point. And then we need to know about intelligence. Is intelligence easy to form? Is it inevitable once life begins? 
If that's true, then you're going to make a believer out of me that there's probably other civilizations out of there, out there that we should be looking for. I mean, I'm not advocating we don't look for these. Of course we should. We're, we lose nothing by trying. But but I'm just saying I'm skeptical that we'll find anything. Highly skeptical that we're going to find anything out there in a civilization level intelligence. So, um, because these other questions have yet to be addressed. There's so much we don't know about the universe and especially about life in the universe that trips like this to Europa and even to Venus, I think, would be would be highly instructive uh, as far as finding life. We keep hearing these things about biomarkers on, on Venus. So um, it's important work. And we're going to have answers in eight years or so. This is January 2022. And in January 2030, this uh, juice will arrive at Jupiter and we'll be able to start providing some answers or at least observations. <clears throat> okay, uh, just look at how long it took ESA Ariane Space to even acknowledge reusable rockets, even though it saw most of the launch market go to the Falcon 9. Uh, yeah, Ariane 6 is coming online now. Unfortunately, none of it is reusable. Um, so... <laughs> It's going to be hard to compete with these reusable rockets for sure. Uh, I don't know how the payload comparison is, but the thing about Ariane 6 is that it is more more modular in terms of it can act like a Falcon 9 or it can act like a big heavy lift rocket Starship class. Uh, you can configure it in a variety of different ways to, for depending on what you want to launch. But again, none of it's reusable, so it's expensive. Now you know, as well as Ariane 5 did with the JWST launch, um, was still quite expensive. It added quite a bit, over a billion dollars to the, the, the launch, I'm sorry, the price tag of the mission. Um, SpaceX is doing things for a fraction of that, about a tenth of that, right, or less. So that's what Falcon 9, of course, and Starship has yet to prove itself. But, but the, the, competitiveness of area m5 is going to suffer because it's not so you're right about that <clears throat> if nasa could more correlate the things they do with, with into economic growth they'd get 10 times the funding they do now i think they try but the fact of the matter is there isn't a lot of economic growth associated with the things that nasa does and i think rightly so what we want NASA to do, what we want any government agency to do is to spend the money in the form of our tax dollars in a in a realm that would not be profitable and would not be do, done necessarily by a profit-making corporation. So it'd be nice to have this work. You think anybody's going to make any, any profit off of sending these things to Europa? No, of course they're not. So SpaceX isn't going to do it just out of the goodness of its heart. Neither is Ariane Space. So why... Why not have NASA do these things? And so um, I don't I don't want NASA to be associated too much with economic growth. Having said that, though, remember to the last hangout we had last week where they're talking about these public private partnerships. I really wanted to ask some questions on that. But the 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 thing NASA wants to do is to create an economy of space and they want to be the big customer, at least at first. SpaceX would not exist if it weren't for NASA as a customer to guarantee it income so that it could build and develop the Falcon 9 and later on Starship and all these other Falcon Heavy and all this other stuff. It needed a customer to make it even worth doing. This is a private corporation that needs to make a profit. NASA is its only real customer and it would not work if NASA hadn't done this. And it's doing it in with other companies as well. Uh, and and uh, Axiom is another one where they're, and, and, and some of these other uh, private companies are building things with NASA as its main customer. Ideally, NASA wants to say, I would like to sign up for one of your launches, or I would like to sign up for one of the products that you offer, whether whatever it is for a private corporation, and then just be a customer, right? That's what they want to do. My question is, and I was going to ask this if I had gotten time last week, is what's the difference between this public-private par partnership thing that they're talking about doing and um, 
what they did in the 60s with building Apollo, where there was all these contractors building things. It seems to me like NASA was a customer there to Rockwell International for building the lunar lander uh, and or the command module or whatever it was they built. I mean, that what's the difference? I don't see it. We've They've always had contractors. NASA never really built the stuff theirself. In fact, the JWST ISIM module, the Integrated Service or the Integrated Science Instrument module that does all of the science for JWST was the first thing NASA ever built from scratch itself. It always got JPL or somebody else to do the building of the instruments. So it's not one to build things on its own. And what's the difference between what they're doing now with this public-private partnership business and um, the contractor model that they have, have had all along? So, so anyway, uh, <clears throat> thank you. I appreciate it. Mac, uh, Mac, Mac, is that right? Mac, um, appreciate that. Um, uh, let's see. I also have a soft for JAXA. That's the Japanese uh, aerospace agency. Uh, yeah, they've built uh, quite a few things. They're, they're on their way to, a, I think they're on the way to a comet or they, did they, um, what was the comment they were going towards the asteroid? I forgot now. But JAXA is another is another big uh, Japanese uh, aerospace company. Um, let's see. Us humans have a bad habit of thinking we and Earth are special. Weren't we once the center of the universe? We still think we are. Uh, but yes. <clears throat> uh, let's see. RB is commenting, if it is found, I doubt the conclusion can be made directly. It isn't through panspermia. It is not said that a meteorite won't penetrate uh, the crust. Um, if it is found. I think I missed the first part of your comment there. Let's see. I can't. Hey, Adam. Yeah, I can see him, and I thanked him. So, yes, um, I can. And I do see Twitch notifications. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, man, just got here and I hear Venus. To me, it's a potential giant factory with an absurd amount of energy available and cities and clouds will conquer its service at some point if there if we're if we're there. Uh yeah, that's another that's a there's two there's two planets I think that we've really neglected and uh, Uranus is one and Venus is the other. I think we should get to both of those and just, and, and learn more about them. Um, Venus, I think is, is uh, a little more interesting to a lot of people for that. Um, but yeah, it's uh, Venus. <clears throat> Venus has potential, at least in its higher upper atmosphere. I, <laughs> apparently the temperatures up there are, you know, like 70 Fahrenheit. So it's pretty comfortable up there. Of course, uh, there's still no air to breathe, but, um, <clears throat> so Will's, Will's commenting. Yeah, that's sort of what I meant. Oops. Sorry. It scrolled on me. That's sort of what, that's kind of what I meant more of creating an economy. Well, that's what they want to do. NASA's that's NASA's stated goal. They want to create a space economy and they want to be a customer in it. <clears throat> this is the Nick. Oh, slick. Uh, what does the scientific community make of SpaceX desire to go to Mars and beyond? It gets me excited, but I'm not, a, uh, I'm not a scientist. Uh, I think the scientific community has a love hate relationship with, with SpaceX right now. Um, on the one hand, Starlink is ruining a lot of ground-based observatory, uh, observations, especially near dawn and dusk. Um, and but of course, going to Mars is something everybody wants to do. So um, the science, I think there's kind of a love-hate relationship there. Uh, going to Mars will get a lot of people excited. I would argue that going to the moon would uh, make people just as excited, especially if we establish more permanent uh, presence there. And I'm a big advocate for going to the moon first and then getting out to Mars. The problem with Mars is, among other things, it's so far away. We're looking at a year to get there and back. Um, and um, all of the stuff has to be brought with us. And very little can be used, at least at first, uh, 
the resources of Mars once we're there. Uh, it's going to be very expensive, extremely dangerous, and highly risky in terms of nobody getting killed. So I would love it if we would just concentrate on the moon for a bit, really focus on it, solve a lot of the problems that would be uh, solved from being on the moon and then getting to Mars. Yes, I know it's not as sexy, but um, there's more to this than just keeping the public excited. I think we need to do this right because one disaster will kill it for a very, very long time, do more harm than good, I think. So, um, um, so I think there's a lot of scientific interest in getting to Mars, especially for people. Um, so they would support it. But like I said, there's other things SpaceX is doing that's kind of pissing off a lot of astronomers. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's true. Neptune, we we could do a lot of, uh, we could do a lot more with as well. <clears throat> I haven't. I think that's a series. Have I watched uh, For All Mankind? I think that's on Apple TV. Is that right? I don't get that. So I haven't watched it. Um, and Jimmy D. I love how you guys from Australia always manage to make it. I love that. Thank you for showing up, man. Um, is NASA on schedule for getting back to the moon? Um, well, you know, that's whole SLS business. We got If you want to know how we're going to get, when we're going to get to the moon, you have to follow the space launch system uh, schedule. And it is way behind because that's the whole thing on which Artemis is built. Artemis is our mission to get us back there. So um, I think we're, we're, I think it was, what was it? During the Trump administration, they wanted to get there in 2024. Is that what it was? That ain't going to happen. Uh, 2025 is probably what's going to be more realistic. It all depends on this rocket. And and they can't even get decent tests made, tests done of this rocket. And I think NASA has opened up the possibility of using Starship. but I think this is kind of a done deal. We're kind of stuck with, with SLS. So with Artemis anyway. So I think we need to keep track of that rocket program. We need to see some flights from the space launch system before we can really talk about getting back to the moon again. I think there was, a, I don't have it on the top of my head, but I think there was a plan to fly around the moon in 2024. So in a couple of, that would be Artemis 1. I think Artemis one is going to go just fly around and come back. So <clears throat> I think it's a good, at a good area for economic growth in space is getting rid of the junk orbiting the planet. Anybody who creates a viable way of doing it has years of work ahead. And Jay Buck, you're right. Uh, I've talked about this many times. There are companies whose job it is, is to do this space debris cleanup and to also have robotic repair missions to repair satellites that are broken down. Also to push them up into higher orbits or different orbits to move them around. That is definitely a growth industry. And if I were a billionaire in this day and age, I think that would be the company I would want to start is a company that would clean up space debris and repair satellites that are repairable using some kind of robotic thing and moving them to different orbits. That's all doable. That's all stuff we should be doing now. And I think that's coming out. Uh, um, I think that's coming out really, um, really soon. I want to just, let me look at uh, robotic repair missions. Let's see what comes up. Uh, uh, let's see. Okay, here's a study. Hubble robotic repair mission, too costly. That's from space.com. Uh, big step for robotics. One robot repairs another in space. That's back in 2014. Um, there were some companies, though. That's what I'm looking for. Space Robotics. Let's look at their let's click on their ad. Uh, robotic and servicing, unlocking the true promise of space. Uh, this company is, that is, uh, saying that as humanity expands its reach within and across space, the ability to robotically assemble service and manufacture assets in space will be essential for safety and sustainability. So they're looking at doing in orbit satellite assembly, servicing and transportation. Uh, so there's one company that's willing, that's wanting to do that. Um, 
there's others. I, I just can't remember what they are off the top of my head. But yeah, you're right, man. That's a good way. That's a good, that's a profit center right there. <clears throat> uh, that's right. Titan is another big uh, target. And of course, um, Dragonfly is sent is, is NASA's Dragonfly mission, which I'll do a hangout on again later. Is also going to be a quadcopter that they send to fly around there. So, um, Stevie, thank you, man. I appreciate this very much. I do appreciate it. You guys, you guys are awesome. Um, apparently, Artemis Four isn't even a landing mission, so there's that. If long-term presence on the moon is one of our program's goals, that's going to take a while at this rate. Absolutely true. The rate we're going, it's going to take forever. Um, <laughs> Trash X. <laughs> that should be the name of the company, right? I like that. Um, let's see. <clears throat> Marian Music is commenting, experts in optics say that JWS pictures will not be as sharp as the one taken with Hubble, and this is due to the fact that JWST's mirror is made of 18 very small mirrors. My opinion, thanks. Yes, well, there's two factors here. One is that the wavelength at which JWST is going to be observing infrared um, is is harder to focus, and in, 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 at least to the resolution that that the detectors are capable of looking at. So I don't know that you can compare the two. Um, the best looking infrared image I ever saw was to see Hubble horsehead IR. It's this one. And that is a pretty, let's see if I can make it bigger. Um, that's a pretty, that's a pretty in focus picture in the infrared. Um, so, um, but, but it is a notoriously difficult wavelength to get very high resolution out of. So I think the big, the, the pretty picture aspect of JWST, JWST, I think is going to be disappointing for a lot of people. Um, for that reason. So I would say um, that they won't be as sharp. I agree. Um, but uh, I don't think the 18 mirrors are going to uh, have that much of an impact on that in terms of how sharp they are. Um, that's just my opinion. So, uh, but I do agree that JWST's infrared images won't be as sharp at least out of the gate, they'll have to do a lot of processing on them afterwards to get them to look anywhere near close to like this. Um, but again, we have to remember that JWST has a different mission, right? It's going to be looking at different things. It's going to be looking at very distant galaxies and stars. All of these things are very are at the resolution limits of the telescopes that we have now. So I think clear, crisp pictures are not is not a big priority for JWST. It's going to be the the data itself, the, especially the spectra themselves of what and the nature of the data that we're looking at from galaxies to stars and spectra of exoplanet atmospheres. That's going to be the biggie. But who knows? I mean, they have, what kind of magic they can put out with it? It might be good enough. Well, I just have to wait and see. Um, that's a good point, Marion. I, I do get your point. Do we have Hubble the do we have Hubble the NRO the NRAO made uh, and they gave to NASA um, one will be the Nancy Grace Roman will Nat will will what will NASA do with the other one you know they haven't said what you're talking about is the NRO the National Reconnaissance Office gave NASA two Hubble chassis that they didn't need anymore. <laughs> which begs a lot of questions but okay um it they don't it doesn't have um, you know, they didn't need it for whatever reason. They had enough Hubbles looking down at the earth. I did only like to think about that. Um, and they built W first, the Nancy Grace Roman space telescope out of one. What is the other one? I haven't heard. Um, I don't, maybe they cannibalized two of them to make the spacecraft bus for uh Nancy Grace Roman space telescope. I don't know, uh, but I haven't heard about what they're going to do with the other one. <clears throat> where is l2 in the van allen belts i'm not sure i understand that question 
Yes, that's true. Spitzer did have a lot of great images in the IR. Let's take a look at some. Uh, Spitzer images. So if we look at Spitzer, yes, these are, but you have to understand the wavelength range of Spitzer was, was very broad. Um, compared to JWS, JWST. These are almost optical images in many ways. So um, the Spitzer Space Telescope had a much different wavelength range than JWST does. But you can see here in a lot of these, uh, you can see the dust lanes, uh, something that IR is very good at showing, uh, dust grains, things like that. Um, infrared view of M81. This is the kind of infrared views you get from galaxies, which are beautiful by many, uh, well, I think they're beautiful by any measure, but uh, this is the kind of thing you'll see uh, from Hubble. I'm sorry, JWST. But this is what I expect to see. <laughs> Stuff like this, right? Very fuzzy things from very distant, uh, from very distant parts of the universe. I think this, um, are, these are the uh, most important images that we take with space telescopes. I found many of you know how I feel about the Hubble Deep Field. It is the most important image we've ever taken, but it was not a pretty one. It was not a pretty image. But once you understand what they mean and the context of these message, these images, then you can't help but be amazed by them. Here's a beautiful image of a nebula. Uh, it looks like... Uh, uh, neutron star and also it's important to realize that these spitzer images a lot of them were composites with hubble so these were both spitzer and um hubble images and here's one that's got it's a composite of the crab nebula which included spitzer the vla hubble space telescope xmm newton and chandra so a lot of these images are composites like this of uh, with using other space telescopes what is that? <laughs> Here's micro lensing illustration. This is which how you can see a brown dwarf passing in front of a star. Um, the macro lensing event, Pandora cluster seen by Spitzer. These are illustrations, illustration, illustration. Here's some images: bow shocks in space, speeding stars. Um, this is, but this is also this is a composite with Spitzer. Uh, and Ys. So you get multi-wavelengths here uh, with these images. So you're right, but Spitzer did have a lot of great images. Yep, Hubble can take images in the near IR. That's a, in fact, it's primarily an infrared telescope now. Um, I watched a NASA Q&A, and they said the first images they released will be called the wow pictures to garner interest, so they should be okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure they're going to, you know, try and release the, the prettiest ones they can first. You're right. Can JWST see the smaller light signatures that can determine if life is, was, present? Yes, that's a huge science goal for, for JWST. We'll have near spec. Near spec is the near infrared spectrometer, which will have the ability to measure the light coming through uh, the atmosphere of any exoplanet. So light shines from a star. There's a there's a star. There's an exoplanet passing in front in a transit method kind of way. It's passing in front. The light from that star passes through the atmosphere of that exoplanet if it has one and travels to JWST's detector, where it will look at that light with a spectrometer and it will be able to see any biosignatures that are there. Huge use for JWST. It was one of the things it was designed to do. Not only that, but it can also look at reflected light that is coming from an exoplanet. So let's say the exoplanet passes in front of the star and then kind of goes off to the side a little bit. Well, JWST has on near spec and near cam, well, it has it over to the whole image plane, micro shutters. And these micro shutters can block out the light only from that star. And we can see now because there's, because the light has been blocked out of the very bright star, 
we can see now the light reflected off of that exoplanet. And because it's an infrared telescope, which is what this, that light will be the brightest in the infrared. Because it's a reflected object, you're looking at heat coming off of the planet itself. You'll be able to directly image and see a picture of that exoplanet right there. So we'll be able to measure the atmosphere as light comes through. We'll be able to also look at the reflected light off of that exoplanet as it moves off to the side of its orbit and reflects onto JWST's detectors. Also, the spectrograph can look at that and see if, what the characteristics are of the reflected light that it reaches and, what, what, uh, and it tells you a lot about the composition of the planet itself. So we're going to get a lot more information about a lot of exoplanets from JWST. Remember, the um, when we were talking about the observations of the first year of JWST, we went through some of the observation schedule, and one of them was it's going to look at TRAPPIST-1D, um, Trappist I think. I forget the exact exoplanet, with the sole purpose of measuring its atmosphere. So that's one of the places it's going to look in the first year. So yes, it can do all of those things. And while it won't determine if life, well, the way it'll determine if life is present is look for these biomarkers, things like, and the thing that always stops, comes off in the top of my head are the, there's a certain kind of methane molecule that if it exists is only created by life. And if they see that molecule, and there's some others too, that if they see those there, that's the only way they could be there is if life was present on the planet. So they look for those biosignatures and they can tell you definitively if life exists there. They won't be able to say what kind other than maybe it's plant or something else. But yeah, it'll have that ability. It will definitely have that ability. Uh, Ebone is commenting, uh, Van Allens are close to Earth and quite far away from L2. Uh, yeah, I don't understand. I still don't understand the question. Um, <clears throat> when is Hubble deorbiting? Uh, estimate, well, uh, 2035 is when, I think, is the last uh, upper limit to how long it can stay in orbit. Its orbit is decaying, as we know, uh, due to the friction of the upper atmosphere with Hubble's orbit. And uh, 2035 is the number that I, I keep hearing. Uh, so a little over 10 years, what is that, 13 years now, uh, we have to get something together to grab onto that little ring in the back and push it up to a higher orbit. I think that'll happen. I think they'll save it. Uh, but as we saw in that one, in that one search result, that it's just going to cost too much to try and save Hubble, so or repair it. So they're not going to try and do that now. Um, hey, Dennis, welcome. I'm glad you caught it too. <laughs> or else you're going to piss off the. Uh, we paid ten billion for this crowd. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So the um, let's see. So JWST cannot image the Earth. Why is it classified? No, but why would you want to? What do you get other than ruining a ten billion dollar telescope? What do you get by looking at the Earth with something that large? What's the reason for it? Do, are you just want to see what you can see? Um, we already know there's Hubble-sized 2.4-meter-class telescopes in orbit probably looking at Earth. That's plenty of resolution uh, capability to read license plates uh, in space. So why would you want to use it for that? Um, you have to understand it's designed to look for things in the early universe. You know, we're looking at things just after the Big Bang. These are very faint galaxies. So we need a lot of light collecting ability in the form of a big primary, and we need sensitive instruments, detectors in the form of CCDs and whatnot, cameras, to see these things. Uh, that's what it's designed to look at. You would design something very, very different for looking at something bright like the Earth from only a couple of hundred miles away. Um, so that would be a different telescope entirely. I don't know for sure, because it is classified, but I'll bet the National Reconnaissance Office has Hubbles looking at the Earth. Why else would they have spares? <laughs> That's the question no one seems to be asking. It's like, what? This is a spare? 
from the National Reconnaissance? You had extra Hubbles? <laughs> now, admittedly, it's not the same Hubble as what's looking at distant galaxies. It's probably got different detectors and different optical arrangements. <laughs> but it's like, well, the minute I heard this, I guess it was back in 2015 or 2014, I first heard about this, and I'm like, what the hell is NRO doing with extra Hubbles? Um, but you would have needed, in order for that to be deployed, you would have needed the space shuttle. So this would have happened during the space shuttle era. That's how Hubble was deployed. In fact, it was designed specifically for the space shuttle to get up into space. It took every inch of that cargo bay. In fact, it, stuff had to be removed to get it to fit in there properly. So we have to think back on the shuttle mission. Do we remember classified launches? Because that's what they would have been. It would have been aboard the shuttle, and we couldn't have known what they were. And that'll probably give us some idea of when it was launched, these things. Because it would have had to have been the space shuttle if they're Hubble clones, right? So I don't know. I don't. I know that sounds very conspiracy theory-like, but I'm just, I mean, I really am just asking. That seems kind of weird. What the hell are they doing with extra Hubbles? Anyway, um, you don't want to look at web with the earth. You just, it's just not something you want to do. Um, and so Dennis said he watched JWST yesterday. It's bright about mag 15. Uh, well, that's good. And I guess people are looking at it with the unistellar telescopes, which is cool too. Um, Let's see. Uh, if CFCs show up somewhere in the spectrograph, chlorofluorocarbons, that might, is that a bio signature or just <laughs> the fact that they have hairspray? Um, oh, dude, you're right about this. Um, uh, Metascension is, um, Save Hubble sounds like a pretty good marketing stunt for SpaceX or something. Yeah. If SpaceX wanted to get a lot more fans, I mean, you either love or you hate Elon Musk, right? I'm on the, I'm kind of back and forth with that guy. Um, but, um, I mean, I, I bought Starlink. It works great. I'm streaming to you now on Starlink. So it, I'm very happy with it so far. Uh, but the guy's a bit of a douchebag. So, you know, if he wanted to come along and say, I'll save Hubble, I'm sure it'll go a long way to giving a lot of uh, pub positive relations to him. Um, so... <laughs> You like my background, huh? Yeah. Dun, 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 dun. In fact, whenever Charlotte texts me, it's the Jetsons theme song. Um, and Peter's saying, yeah, it'll be, it'll burn the camera and all that kind of stuff. It's not a good idea to point JWC to the earth. Um, Dennis is commenting, there's a small glitch with one of the mirror position sensors, but they say the actuator itself is fine, so the mirror can still be positioned properly without the data feedback. Right. So he, I think there's like 100 and some odd actuators for each of those mirror segments that they're using. So, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so thanks, Dave Primal. I appreciate this. You know, I was asking myself the other day why I do this. Why am I creating content? Why am I streaming? Um, and, what you know, why do I do this at all? And, my, the an and, and I needed to come up with a good answer to this because it was concerning me. I wasn't quite sure why I was doing it. And I've, I've remodeled the Space Junk Podcast podcast, and I'm about to publish a new episode on that now because I wasn't happy with the content from before, but I've discovered that I really enjoy it when a good when I make a good piece of content, regardless of who, if anybody ever watches it. It just makes me feel good. That's one reason. The second reason is that I'm old now. I'm in my, I'm almost 60, and I don't, and I don't work in the field anymore. Uh, and I don't write a lot of software anymore and things like that. So I want to keep my brain sharp. And so I want to learn new things. And I want to always be asking new questions and learning new things. So I stream the topics that I want to learn more about. And I share it with you. Like today, I want to learn a little bit more about the um, uh, missions that are coming up to the Jupiter moons. Um, and so and I and the way that I learn and the way that Richard Feynman is sort of verified as a good way to learn is that the best way to learn something is to try and teach it to someone else. So I pass on whatever I try to do on these live streams and that helps cement the um, knowledge or the, the, you know, whether or not I've able to teach it on a live stream any, in any 
measure of effectiveness indicates how well I've learned it. And so I do it for that reason. And next week, I, I mean, on Thursday, I want to learn more about these different kinds of black holes that are out there because I've been doing this a long time and black holes have usually just been the deaths of star, massive stars and supermassive black holes have been this uh, coalescing of all these galaxies and galaxy collisions. But it turns out there's a lot of different kinds of black holes out there and I want to learn about them. So I'm spending some time doing that now. I'm going to share that with you on Thursday, but there's stellar sized black holes. There's galactic supermassive black holes. There's primordial black holes. What the hell are they? There are, they are, um, there's micro black holes which I want to know more about. How in the hell do these things get made? So I, I'm going to talk about black holes on Thursday, and we're going to go through that in depth because I want to learn more about it myself. And I'm not, I'm not in this for any kind of ego. I do not want to build a large community. I do not want to be internet famous, but I do want to learn new things. And so, uh, you know, I just share it with you. And if you guys like it, great. And thank you for this really great comment because it proves that I'm at least halfway decent at it. I don't know. Um, more thoughts on the space junk problem. Push it back into the atmosphere. The name of that name of that company, Satellite Inc. Push them back into the atmosphere. I don't understand that comment, Jay Buck, but um, I'll, I'll look. Uh, let's see. Oh, hey, Christian. It's good to see you. Glad you're here. Um, go to his channel and he does, you know, a lot more than I do as far as content creation and, 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 and stuff of a lot higher caliber. So, um, so definitely, uh, check out the launchpad astronomy. <clears throat> I know, right? Don't call me an old fart, but I am, I'm almost 60. Ah. Um, all right. Hey, Marty or Nick, I always like the SFN. I get that you don't do them anymore because it's a lot of work. These streams podcasts are a good alternative. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. I I don't know. I like the interaction way more than sitting around, writing a script, doing the script, putting up the visuals, do the editing, post the thing, and wait for comments to come afterward, 90% of which are not nice. So why do I even want to read those? That's a lot of work. And... Um, you know, with the way YouTube and monetizing and all that, you, you can't make money at it. So uh, I have to do it for enjoyment. And this is the way I get enjoyment out of creating content is by doing it live. My per my packaged content, that is Space Junk Podcast. I'm going to be, I'm, I'm doing videos on that. I'm going to repurpose a lot of that stuff. Uh, so Space Junk Podcast is where I'm putting all my efforts on that right now. Uh, but yeah, SFM was fun. And SFM... It's kind of integrated into uh, the new Space Chunk format. Um, the, new, the new format goes 20 minutes of me talking about something I'm interested in. Uh, you'll recognize some of these topics because there's stuff I've done streams on. Terraforming the Moon is the first one. And then there's 20 minutes of me and Dustin talking about telescopes and gear. And then there's 20 minutes of me doing space news and what's up in the night sky. That is the new format of Space Chunk Podcast. And so, and I can break those up into different... Um, products if i want to i know so <coughs> so oh thank you so much <laughs> i, I want to marry you christian thank you for saying that <laughs> i'm very i don't i i look at myself sometimes like look at that gray hair wow that's a lot of gray hair but anyway thank you man thank you dennis um Sit and spin. Yes, the one the one frame astrophoto gets ruined pretty bad by satellites. But if you run a series of them at least several times, the algorithms like Kappa Sigma clipping get rid of them very well. Um, yes, and you also need to realize that a lot of the satellite trails are a function of the geometry in which you're taking them, right? So that's why dusk to dawn tends to have the most of them. You got the sun low in the sky, shining on a satellite that's in low Earth orbit, coming down and, and reflecting into your eyeball. Same in, at, at dawn where that happens as well. You get a lot of reflections, a lot of star satellite trails. Um, but as you know, as Dennis points out, you take several of these. You can you can not the, the, the trails won't always be in the same spot. You can get the data depending on the cadence of the of the ex exposures. You can build yourself an image without the satellite trails in them. However, that's not to say you don't lose data because you do. If a satellite is moving through one frame 
and it's a transitory thing that you only get in that one frame where you've lost it forever. Uh, so it is a, it is a problem. Um, I'm conflicted about the whole Starlink thing. I love the service. It works great. I can take it with me out in the middle of nowhere and I can use, I can have, you know, almost gigabit level internet wherever I go, but it comes at the price of our night sky. And how often do we want to, you know, sacrifice these natural resources in the sake of a more convenient lifestyle. I happen to think internet is one of the things that um, is more vital uh, than in almost anything else we're doing uh, in, in civilization right now. And I think it should be more widely available to people who can't get it. And I think that rich countries have, have had too much internet for too long. And I think that we should be able to spread this out where countries that don't have access to internet can suddenly get it and that improves their quality of life. So I'm more in favor of this than I am against it, which is why I bought it. <clears throat> and, um, however, if you want to talk about what's killing the night sky, yes, satellite trails are a problem, but so the, so is night, you know, street lights pointing up into the sky. Why in the hell are parking lots being lit in such a way that the lights are pointing straight up? Who needs that? Let's 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 get light pollution under control and I think we'll do a lot to regain our our natural resource of the night sky that way. Because for Christ's sake, we don't need all of this lighting that's out there in our cities right now. You can look at a car lot in America uh, that sells cars and it looks like a spaceport and it looks like it from space because you can they're just so brightly lit and the lighting is going up everywhere. So I think that is a is something we should work harder on. Um, I don't know what to say about this the satellite trails. Studies have been done with astronomers. They know what they're going to be missing. There are things they can do to mitigate the damage done by satellite trails. The people who will suffer the most are the large-scale sky surveys like LSST, Vera Rubin, that are taking pictures of the entire sky all night long, several times a week, looking from dawn to dusk, those images, 30% of which they're, they're estimating, are going to be unusable. So they're going to lose 30% of their data due to these satellite trails. That's a big deal. And it's something that astronomers are just going to have to pay the price on, all because one billionaire decided he's going to do these launches. And he could do it because he could. So regardless, you know, of what you think about Elon Musk and SpaceX, there are, there's collateral damage there that one guy just inflicted on people without asking anybody's permission. Now to me, morally, that's, that's a big problem. So, you know, I'm not excusing it, but I am conflicted by the whole thing. On the one hand, I see everybody's point. On the other hand, I freaking love the, uh, the, the internet connection I have. So that's my little rant on that. <clears throat> uh, so anyway, <laughs> I know, Jabe. I know. I don't know offense taken. <laughs> yep, yep. No, I know. And I'm living the life I want to. So um, I'm doing exactly what I want when I want. And, and you know, I'm, I'm very privileged in that way. So I hear you. All right, guys, I'm getting... I'm getting tired, so I'm going to stop soon. Um, <laughs> let's see. I would I forgive Elon if he would deploy three Louvoirs. Louvoir, large inf large UV infrared optical um, and radio telescope. What is it? What is it? Louvre. Oh, you spelled it wrong. Optical IR. So it's U L U V O I R, and it's uh, UV optical infrared telescope. That's going to make JWST look like a Celestron 8 telescope when it launches. It's going to be huge, um, and it will have more wavelength range from the UV all the way out to the infrared. So, uh, yes, I would forgive him, too, if he would deploy three of those. <laughs> all right, guys, I am, I am out of here. I will see you on Thursday. We'll talk about black holes. Depending on when Dustin gets back to me uh, on the new uh, Space Junk podcast format, I'll have it posted this week, I hope. I'm just waiting for his approval to see if he likes it or not. And uh, I'll have that posted, so look for that. And um, I'm thinking of starting a Sunday night stream. I've, I've threatened this before in the past, um, and so I may do uh, 
may do a Sunday night stream starting soon. So I'll let you know when that's going to happen. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you for watching me and thank you for supporting me. And I'll see you guys on two on Thursday. And as always, keep looking up.